Hello there and welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash and I am your host on this journey through men's style, self-development and personal grooming. Now the time has come for a question and answer session for us chaps. And as you will probably know, I encourage you to drop me a question at any time. You can put it into the comment section below or send me an email directly. If you look in the about section on the YouTube page, you will find my email address. Send me an email, I'll either respond to you if I can straight away, or I'll save up those questions and they will go into a Q&A session just like us. So let's get started on those questions. So today there's a broad section and let's just get going. I'll take them as they come. So first is a question from Victor Hobson who asks, uh, happy anniversary Ash, two years on the YouTube, many more to come hopefully. Thanks for the advice so far. So, I would like to ask, are Loke belts as good as their shoes? I've got a number of their shoes and I would like the belt to match in style and colour. What are your thoughts? Well, Loke, for the uninitiated, obviously are a, uh, a long-term British shoe manufacturer who also branch out uh, sort of laterally and make other leatherwear products as well. They make I think some luggage and some belts. Now good quality leather belts are hard to come by and they are not cheap, that is fair to say. But actually I do own a Loke leather belt in a light tan colour and I've had it for a number of years. It's been a stalwart companion, it's held up to the passage of time. So Victor, in answer to your question, I think Loke belts do a pretty good job at a very modest price, check out eBay, you might be able to find something at, a, at an incredibly cheap price. But yes, invest in your leather belts. That's a good sort of overarching response because people often go cheap on their belts when they've spent perhaps a small fortune on their footwear. And as you know, cheap items stand out like a sore thumb. Invest reasonably across the whole ensemble of your clothing and people will see you for what you are, an intentionally well-dressed chap. Now, the next question is from Mike, who says, please could you advise me of the right nightwear for men to wear when they have that special someone coming to stay for the night? That is quite a risky question. Um, my answer, uh, or if you'd like to know what I wear to bed, um, I wear whatever is most comfortable for me. Now, for you, it might be the emperor's suit, new clothes, or it might be, you know, a nightgown. Whatever floats your boat, Mike, I hope the answer is uh, satisfactory for you. So next question is from Not Always Right, and he says, Hi Ash, wondering about rings as an accessory to a man's style. Are there any guidelines as to how men should actually wear their rings? Also, what are the history of certain rings, signet rings, and so on? Would love to hear your opinion. Well, you're absolutely right. Rings are a, a very omnipresent thing when it comes to most men. Now, I have to admit, as you can see, I am not a wearer of rings. I, I've been married for many years, but I don't actually wear a wedding ring. This is a matter of personal choice for me. It's just that I don't like the feeling of having rings, and they often get caught up in things. It's not for me. But rings, of course, have been around for a long time. Signet rings go back centuries where they have acted as a sort of uh, seal of office for great people, you know, lords and uh, ladies and people who hold uh, great power over others. Even to the modern day, I think when a new pope uh, the leader of the Catholic faith takes office, you know, they have a special ring made, which is the seal of their office for the period which they are the pontiff over the faith. Uh, and of course, these seals, when somebody was signing an official document, some wax would be dropped on the parchment or the vellum, and the ring would be pushed into the wax to leave an impression, and that would be the equivalent of having a notarized signature on an official document. Over time, you know, I mean, like they, if we look back in history, you will see rings which were worn by Romans and even beyond, and they would have been made of precious metals, particularly, of course, gold, easy to work with, readily available precious metal. Um, so the rings of the modern era, you know, they still follow that large, uh, largely similar 
a pattern, precious metal worn with significant emblems upon them or decorated with stones which have some relevance. Um, so what are my thoughts about the wearing of rings in the modern era? I don't personally wear them but I don't fall out with them either, particularly if it is of some personal significance. So if it is a wedding ring, I think that's great. If you're a gentleman and you're a graduate of a university or uh, you know a some other establishment of learning where perhaps a ring would be the classical way of identifying other people who share that same uh, history. Um, I know in certain bodies of people like the Freemasonry they will wear rings which have emblems relating to their craft as well so it is identifiable to other people and it is something which you enjoy wearing yourself. I'm not going to say is anything wrong or right about it what I would say is if you are going to wear a ring like all things in men's style less is normally more so you know let's not wear four rings on one hand or you know three rings on one hand two on the others I would suggest if a gentleman wears a ring on one hand that would be sufficient so a wedding ring that's your left hand done if you're going to wear a signet ring on your right hand wear one signet ring that will be it any more than that I would suggest would be overkill and you'll be drawing unnecessary attention to your digits just my thoughts take from that what you will Okay, so our next question is from regular uh, contributor, and that is Vic and Lucy, who have asked, Hello Ash, I would like to know how you find the correct size of a trench coat and how it should fit as sizes are different to other garments. Um, I've noticed that when the sleeves are the correct length, the rest is baggy, and when the rest fits, the sleeves are too short. Well, interesting question. I guess... When buying any sort of outerwear, you have to be conscious of what you're going to be wearing under that garment. So if you wear an overcoat, for instance, and you traditionally take, shall we say, for instance, a size 40 chest, if you buy an overcoat, which is a 40 chest, you would imagine that the garment manufacturer will take into account the fact that if you're buying an overcoat, the gentleman might be wearing a suit underneath and they would factor in that little bit of extra space to allow that garment to fit over a suit. But don't take it for granted. Always remember, overcoats are things that it's best to try on before making a purchase. Because if you don't and you buy one which is too tight, it's going to be quite challenging to come back from that. However, if you buy one which is a little baggy, you can always get it tailored. A nip and a tuck makes it fit pretty well. So always try on, always consider what you will be normally wearing under it. It would be pretty pointless if you go to the tailors or the clothing outlet in the middle of July, when you're only wearing a shirt, you try on an overcoat and it's rather tight. You think it looks good, but then in the winter time, when you try it on with a sweater and a jacket underneath, it's gonna be super tight. It's not going to fit you. When you try it on, make sure you're wearing enough layers underneath which will replicate what you will be wearing when you're going to wear that overcoat in real life. Just a thought. Okay, our next question comes from Ahmed Toomsey and he says, Hello Ash, hope you're fine. Which other channels and resources do you recommend for a chap interested in classic style? Well, Good question. And of course, like you, I'm a consumer of YouTube prolifically. Uh, you know, most of the time when I'm having a shave in the morning, I've got my iPad propped up and I'm listening to things as I'm going about my ablutions. So the channels which I find myself being repeatedly drawn back to are quite varied. Um, I don't just listen to, to men's style stuff, but the one channel which I think I resonate with the most would be the Gentleman's Gazette. I'm sure you're familiar with that man, Raphael and his team. Um, that's because I like the ethos of that channel. They don't do any paid sponsorship on there. It's all interesting heritage in nature, often a bit of history about clothing as well. Um, they're not promoting things, they're not selling things other than their own, you know, stuff from their own shop. Uh, so they're not taking money to say something is good or otherwise. What you get is generally a pretty solid opinion of things and a good unbiased overview. So Gentleman's Gazette probably 
my favorite YouTube channel. Of course, there are many others. Um, if you're a larger statured gentleman, there's one channel which I can't speak highly enough about. It's called uh, the Big Pretty Channel. And uh, my good friend, Professor Tim Crow, is the host of that channel. So if you're a, a man of larger than normal proportions, his channel is all dialed in to making you large and in charge, as he says. So go and check that one out. I'll leave a link to that. In the, uh, in the description box below. Uh, other things, you know, Real Men, Real Style, Antonio Centeno, of course, been around now for, what, 10 years, giving great advice to men on very much the same topics that I do, men's style, self-development, personal grooming, uh, but with a very much a North American take, which is somewhat different to mine. I think my style is much more sort of laid back and British, typically. Um, the American style, a little, more, little bit more confident, a little bit more shouty. Um, you know, there's a place for that too. But of all of the American ones, RMRS, real men, real style, Antonio Centeno, definitely the place to go. Otherwise, I kind of cruise through. You know, I see what pops up. I don't follow any channels religiously, but uh, I just let, you know, the, the YouTube algorithm suggest things for me and I have a broad intake of material. Best way to be, keep an open mind, particularly when it comes to men's style, because there are things out there that you've previously discounted. You think, oh, that's not gonna suit me, but tastes change. As you age and get older, your tastes change. And you might see a video which you think, Do you know what, that is right up my tree. Cravats, pocket squares. Wouldn't have considered that when I was 25. Now, I'm all over it. So just. Do a bit of broad searching, see what pops up. Okay, so last question for today comes from B-Dog Swings, and he says, good morning, Ash. I like to wear a crimson velvet house coat. Is that okay, or am I just being pretentious? If it is okay, what style of opium pipe would you recommend? Well, I have to say, opium pipes, I don't know. Incidentally, I get loads of questions about pipes and smoking, gentlemen, I'm sorry to burst the bubble. This is just a prop, all right? This is an actual pipe. I do not smoke. I don't advocate smoking. I normally use this to dress the table or to hold down the pages on my notebook, which is usually sat here. So I can't recommend an opium pipe, but when it comes to a velvet house coat, well, that is a place that I've been before. I've got a, a number of velvet house coats. I've got a black one with a shawl collar, and I've got a sort of British racing green velvet. Uh, I would rec I would sort of describe it as a, an alternative tuxedo. And I've worn it a few times to special events or sort of decorative black tie events. Uh, I don't think it's pretentious whatsoever, as long as you wear it in an appropriate situation. So. Let, if you're wearing it around the house, that's fine. You can wear anything you like. But if, you're, uh, if you have a velvet dinner jacket, if you want to call it that, um, the time you shouldn't wear it is if you get an invitation to a black tie event and you think to yourself, I'm going to step outside the dress code and I'm going to wear my velvet, uh, crimson velvet one because I want to stand out from the crowd. Well, actually, you might stand out from the crowd a little bit too much. Do not step outside the dress code unless the invitation suggests that is acceptable. And you will know it's acceptable because it will say, you know, imaginative dress uh, black tie or decorative black tie or alternative black tie. These are code words which mean go nuts, wear what you like, uh, wear an embroidered jacket, wear a, a velvet jacket of any color, but don't wear that coat to a situation where just black tie is suggested. You might stand out from the crowd more than you wish. Okay, gents, I think that's enough for today. We've got enough material here to make another video, which I will do right now, but I'll drop it in in a few weeks' time. Keep things, you know, interesting. Um, what I would say is, please send me your questions. Don't forget that email address in the About section, or drop it to me in the comment section. I would be delighted to hear from you, and I will endeavour to answer your questions in my non-expert, amateur gentleman style. Now, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have, I would encourage you to give us a thumbs up. And don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, click the red button. And if you'd like to practically support the channel, you can buy me a coffee. You will find a link to the Buy Me A Coffee webpage in the description box below. So until the next time, stay cool. I'll see you again very soon.